We are in council chambers. I want to welcome everybody. Um, just for the record, we do have all members of the committee along with our staff. Um, and then um, we'll go through introductions uh, regarding our guests that are here with us as well. Um, if we could, um, approval of the minutes from the last week. Oh, no minutes, no, sorry. Um, discussion items. Tonight there is one item uh, for discussion. It's the school board's long range planning committee, use of the school impact fees. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, turn it over to the superintendent. If uh, we can also have an introduction of all the school board members and staff that are with us, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so why don't we start with introductions? Yeah. Hi, I'm Alicia Giftis, a school board member I'm from the finance committee. Todd Jepson, the school facilities director. Uh, I'm Nick Gell, I'm the chair of the Long Range Planning Committee. <coughs> April Sider, I'm on the Long Range Planning Committee and the finance committee. <laughs> so I'm pulling and double, double dipping. Yeah, double dipping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Okay. But that's not part of my role tonight. That's right. Hopefully. <laughs> and I do want to just clarify for people sure. watching that it's the Long Range Planning Committee for the school board. Yes. That's, yes. Because we do have one for the town as a whole as well. So just, yes, to, just so people understand that. With that, I'll turn it over to you for. Yeah, I'll give a general intro, but then I'm really going to turn it over to Nick in April um, as they prepare the presentation tonight. We. Um, as you all may recall, back in November 2017, the board, the school board at the time, had a long-range facilities plan that included options A through H. Mm -hmm. They narrowed it down to three um, back in November 2017, and then really narrowed it down to one, which would have been um, what we thought the best um, way to serve our community, given what we knew at the time. However, there was no specific vote or action that occurred at that time because we were also in the process, thanks to Todd Good's work, um, of submitting four uh, rating cycle, cycle applications to the Department of Education to see if we could access some funding to do some very necessary um, renovations and right sizing of four of our schools. Um, we did not get the results of that until July 2018. And we learned that a corner school, which will be the topic of our conversation tonight, was the highest on the list for Scarborough, um, but we landed number 34 in terms of the 71 or 77 um, schools that ended up being on the final list. Um, so with that being said, we knew that as soon as we had a full board again, remember in June 2018, we only had four board members, we knew that this would be one of our top priorities. Um, so to prepare it for welcoming our new board and re-engaging our long-range planning committee, um, we also began to look at our enrollment study side by side with what's the new development that's happening in town um, and really started to ask some tough questions about what was included in that enrollment study. Um, and what we were noticing is that it, the, the data had been really accurate. The projections were really accurate to the actuals, plus or minus a few kids, right up until last year when we started to see there being some variance at some of the schools. So we re-engaged Rebecca Wandell, who uh, formerly worked with planning decisions and helped write our initial study. Um, she's now a Scarborough Public Schools employee, so um, we were able to contract with her outside of her school responsibilities to update the study. And the board had a presentation in January 2019 of that, um, the updated enrollment projections and much, the, the, the results of that looked very much like what our predictions anticipated they would. Um, and it's important to note that those, those enrollment studies included also birth rates. So um, we're looking now at that each month to see how accurate it is compared to what our current enrollment is playing out. And again, it seems to be pretty accurate um, and the, the planning committee will talk a bit about, about those numbers in, in their presentation. So that's sort of the intro to just bring us up to where we are today, and then Nick and April will take it away from there. Sounds great. All right. I'll move to the podium so I can control this uh, presentation. So um, for all of you here and all of you watching at home, um, I am Nick Gill. I'm on the school board. I'm also uh, the chair of the Long Range Planning Committee. This presentation is identical to the one um, that I gave and, and with my um, with April and Sarah at the last school board meeting, so it'll look very familiar to many of you. And there are some elements that Julie touched on, so I'll I'll move through those as uh, expeditiously as possible. Um, so I, I kind of wanted we decided to actually start out this presentation with kind of an executive summary kind of a slide, just to kind of get right to the point of what this really comes down to, and that is that what we're looking for is a single trailer. Um, also known as a modular classroom, also known as a, um, what's another word, portable classroom, 
Um, but they are trailers. They come, they come in. They're set in place. We're looking for one trailer. There'll be two classrooms. We're looking to do site preparation for two trailers. And the reason for that is, is that the immediate data that you'll see later in this presentation calls for a single slide, uh, single slide, single trailer. But most likely, if that growth continues in the short term, we may have to expand on that in future academic years. So since the, all the equipment will be there, um, we had the discussion about actually doing the site prep for two trailers, but starting out with just one. Um, there will be a connector to the trailers that will be heated um, so students don't have to step outside the um, climate controlled portion of their day, uh, as they do in, in some other areas of the district, um, to access these new classrooms. The overall cost is $260,000. That is, of course, estimated. Uh, $50,000 of that money is spent on asphalt site work. Um, the reason for selecting asphalt <coughs> as opposed to other options like gravel that could save a small amount of money is that gravel is porous. It does have the opportunity of having uh, un unwanted guests in the form of animals. Uh, and so for the additional small costs, um, the, the district has seen a lot of success with asphalt has in the past, so we chose to go with that. Uh, $30,000 is a heated connector. $160,000 of it is for a single trailer unit. That is two classrooms, as I said earlier. And then $20,000 estimated in finishing, and that's utilities connecting. That's getting these things online so that students can be in them and learning. The overall goal of this is to fund this initial phase, the only phase that the data immediately calls for, with um, fees collected through the school impact. So a little bit of history, and, and Julie touched on a lot of this, but just to kind of touch through it again, um, I'm, I'm kind of starting this story with the 2017 facilities master plan that Julie referenced. And there was, it did come down to, a, to one of the many options that were presented, and the, the primary focus of that option was that a single consolidated primary school seemed to be the, le the best long-term solution for the town in every way that data can measure. Less expensive to build, less expensive to maintain, less expensive to operate, and quite frankly, more conducive to expanding in the future. However, what occurred as part of that is that the community, and, and I'm a lifelong Scarborough myself, so I can share in this, the community has an affection for the, for the schools. I graduated from Eight Corners. I live a stone's throw from Pleasant Hill. So I understand, and I think a lot of us on the committee understand that affection and how important that is in this decision. So while the data may push us in one direction, the quantitative evidence also needs to be met with the qualitative feedback of our community. And that's something that we need to invest in in long-range planning and something that's actually on the docket to start within the next 30 days, actually April 10th to be exact. That's our next meeting. Um, so that's a little bit of the history. So now a little bit of the data behind why we're here. Um, last year, um, enrollment at um, Eight Corners was 227. The enrollment this year is exactly the same. This data might be a little bit old. It might have fluctuated a, a couple heads here and there in the last month or so. Um, but what's forecasted to happen is a significant amount of growth. And this is in the uh, study that uh, Julie referenced, you know, looking at, depending on which flavor of the model you choose, you're talking about 21 to 27 students that is forecasted. Now, what's more alarming is that it's coming true, which is good for the study. We want a study that's robust and that actually produces results that it forecasts. But to give you real numbers of what's actually happening for 1920 so far, we have 78 kindergartners registered as of the time this presentation was put together, which is about a week ago. Um, there are 78 total in the kindergarten class this year, and there hasn't been an informational night to actually bring in that last wave of students that register um, at eight corners. So typically that brings 10 to 15 percent more students in um, above that 78, so that adds 8 to 12 more heads to that. And what's compounding on this, in addition to just the raw numbers, is the fact that 17 of these students are already pre-identified and pre-registered as special service students. Those type of students typically need more space. They require more resource. Um, and there are certainly things that, that Eight Corners has to prepare for. And there are maybe more that come out in the, in the rest of the registration that's going to happen. So the question now is, what do we do? And so I'll turn it over to April. No, I want you to come and do something. So. <laughs> Jump in. So I'll bring it over to April. To, to <laughs> we all put the presentation together, um, but Nick was doing a great job, so it would have been totally fine if he had just stayed with it. Um, <laughs> so this is an overhead site map of the Eight Corners School. Um, the box you'll see off to the right that is yellow 
was a proposed location for a trailer when we were talking about adding just one trailer. Um, and so that is actually not part of the building plan in this new <coughs> presentation that we, where we are trying to plan for um, the potential to add two trailers. And so what you'll see is out in front of Eight Corner School, kind of off to the side of the parking lot, um, will be in red is the um, asphalt pad for two trailers, um, with the first one being closer to the building and then having the um, accessibility to add a second trailer. Um, portable one, which will, as we've said, will house two classrooms, um, should be ready for late fall of 2019. Um, one of the things that's important to keep in mind as we talk about the timeline, and, and Julie pointed this out, is um, we were waiting for the results from the state to determine whether or not we were going to receive any funding, um, which is partially why it, it comes across as if we're really behind the ball. By the time they had those results, they were down to a four-member school board, and really, when we were all elected in November and we were back up to a full board, this was one of the very first <coughs> meetings that mm. I attended. So we really have been talking about this, you know, as early onset as we could. Um, but even with the planning and the and the prep that we've done, the, the cost estimates and the work that Todd has done for us, um, I think Todd will be the first person to say we, we really are behind the ball. Um, in terms of having these ready for the kids in September. Um, that window has passed, unfortunately. Um, and so our amazing faculty will make do and we will um, go along to get along, you know, uh, in those early weeks um, when the kids start. But ideally, this will be ready as soon as possible um, for the fall of 2019. An additional trailer classroom, once the site work is done, could be ready for the fall of 2020. Um, should we decide that we need it. So this is the real reason why we're here, because <laughs> we need to talk about funding sources. Um, we have cited the impact fee ordinance, which is in Chapter 415. Um, the wording of the impact fees um, portion of the school impact fees, when it talks about um, distribution of those fees, is actually out of date. Um, there's a lot of reference to dates in 2012 and et cetera, et cetera. So what we need to do probably is all look at the ordinance together and, and come to an agreement that the ordinance, that this project clearly falls within the bounds of using these impact fees um, for this improvement project, for this renovation project. Um, we also wanted to point out that this is in alignment with the town council's overall goal to bond less and allocate more. Uh, these impact fees have already been collected as non-tax revenue, and they are in an account. Um, and we need town council approval to access those funds. Of course, the alternative um, is that we could bond these, um, this project, and we could talk about it in terms of the uh, CIP for FY19. <coughs> This is the timeline of the presentation um, as far as the Long Range Planning Committee is concerned. We presented this exact same presentation to the full school board last Thursday for questions and comments. We're here tonight, Wednesday, March 27th, presenting to the Town Council Finance Committee um, with the hope that we will bring this um, recommendation forward to the full council at your meeting on Wednesday, April 3rd. We have a plethora of more data in folders that we could bring to you, but I'd much rather just to get to the questions yep, so, so we can answer for you. Great. <laughs> Open it up to discussion. So uh, with that, um, questions from council. Yes, sir. So, you know, there's an expression, timing is everything, or maybe timing is nothing. Uh, so it's pretty clear this has, you know, been in the works for a long time, and I can understand the reasons for why we haven't seen it until now. So uh, even though the timing is horrible, horrible by any measure. So setting that aside and trying to trust motives and, and trying to focus on the issue, how, how, are, how are we uh, as a subset of the town council, you know, a, a finance committee, supposed to be able to make a decision on this with a 
process that you've described, or lack thereof, and this kind of timing, where you're really not even expecting any kind of vote here. You just want us to put it forward before the council for a vote at the time of the first reading of the budget. So that would be a threshold question of mine. So, so I do want to clarify that on April 3rd is not the first reading of the budget. It's the presentation of the budget. OK, the, the first time we'll read it. Correct. Thank you. So how? How are we supposed to decide? Uh, I And uh, this is a big issue, a big strategic issue. We're seeing one thing that's being put forward as, a, hey, we think it'll work. But I don't, I read through the, it's 80 pages of data. And the PowerPoint presentation, which I guess is what, eight slides or whatever, there's no meat in the sandwich here. How do I get from the data to this and then process it and then be fair to you in the process by giving you an answer without somehow expecting this decision would be put through some semblance of process that any other request like this is going to go through over the next several weeks until we vote on a budget on June 11th. Yeah. Go ahead. So I think that uh, I'm not sure I quite understand what you mean by lack of process. This has been uh, an analysis of our long range plan, facilities plan has been going on since I came on board in 2016. We've had architects involved, we've had enro two enrollment studies since then. Um, and I think the reality of it is, is that we have an obligation to respond to the growth impact that's happening in our community. And what's different about public schools is that children will show up. We don't have a choice. We can't turn them away. We can't say there's no room in the inn. We have a, uh, a moral and ethical obligation to ensure that all students get a free and appropriate education. And part of that is ensuring that they have safe spaces to be in in order to receive that education. Um, and so given that we know at Eight Corner School alone we could have as many as 31 new students um, next year. We know 17 of them are absolutely coming because they are already identified through child development services. We need to make sure that we have safe spaces for them and adequate spaces for them. And we don't within, within our current facilities. This is not a surprise to us. This is not a shock. We've been talking about it. We've been forecasting it. Um, but we also live in a community that has a lot of competing priorities. And so back in 2016, when we first were re-engaging the Long Range Facilities Plan, one of the things we said over and over was that this isn't something that can happen overnight. To build a facility, to renovate a facility, it takes time. The shortest, um, most immediate solution is to bring in modular temporary classrooms. And so that's what this proposal um, is, is sharing with you all. So I just I just want to respond to that again. So you said, have said that the school has spent a lot of time and energy on this, but mm -hmm. I personally, and I'm a pretty close watcher of this stuff. I've seen bits and pieces, but I haven't I haven't gone through all the twists and turns that you have. Mm -hmm. And I, I I don't want to speak for my fellow uh, committee members or the council, but I think it's probably not unreasonable to, to suggest that we have had no line of sight into this other than it being posted to the agenda last Thursday, I think it was, and the time between then and now to be able to get comfortable that we're going to put this forward to the council for a vote without any kind of public input. I mean, there was, we had a communications, a joint communications committee meeting last night. The first question was, uh, someone saying, I don't, or if it was a statement, somebody saying, I don't think we should have trailers any place in the district. So that's a marker. That's one marker. Mm -hmm. and this is from the public. The other marker is uh, we should have a new school, a new K through two school. That's a, the alpha and the omega mm -hmm. of the range. And you've picked something, well, this is it. Got to have it. We have needs to meet. To meet and uh, we just want to you know, put this on a fast pass. It's well, like so at Disneyland. I see it very differently. One, um, we believe that there shouldn't be trailers. We shouldn't have trailer classrooms in our schools either. Um, I, 
I think I've said this many times publicly, but I'll say it again, that when I first interviewed in Scarborough, I was shocked during the interview process that there were no questions about facilities because just from my own sort of exterior periphery analysis, I expected that to be a priority um, given what uh, I thought I knew about the community at the time and what were clearly needs. So um, I think the other, the other piece of this that's important for us to know is that we, have the, we collect school impact fees for this exact purpose to respond to growth and to um, address <coughs> bricks and mortar issues that we have. And so this couldn't fit, this project actually fits perfectly um, in our request for accessing those school impact fees that have been collected for well over a decade um, <coughs> in Scarborough and we've never accessed them in this emergent way before. So typically the way those school impact fees are used from my understanding is that it's used um, to um, pay down the debt each year. And so, of course, having a newer school in the community being the Wentworth School, we've been accessing the fees in that way. This year is different because we have this emergent need. We have an immediate need. Children are coming, and we need a place for them to go. It also, as April said, directly aligns to a goal that the council has, which is to bond less and appropriate more. Um, and so we think that given that the, these funds are available, the most fiscally responsible thing for us to do would be to access the school impact fees and work as closely as we can to being ready for the start of the school year. So um, I have a couple of questions that, um, so I think your comments are um, very well taken. I'd like to talk about the process maybe after getting some data to support the presentation first because process is very different from the quality of the presentation. So the, I have a couple. First is, where are we in a permanent solution as far as long range planning? Because I know, and, and by the way, um, I remember sitting in a session two years ago maybe, in which you gave a very, it was maybe three because I think it was maybe your first year, um, very thorough, you know, what are our solutions going forward? And it was system wide, it wasn't, so where are we in a, this is not a permanent solution. So where are we in a permanent solution as far as something being brought forward? Yeah, I can speak to that. Yeah. Um, so kind of going back to November really quick, when I came on board as a, as a board member, um, one of the first things I was made aware of is that we have a long-range planning committee that's been kind of in recess for about a year. And it's actually since about the time that the very presentation we started talking yeah. about was given out. Yeah. Um, and so what we started with in the committee was kind of this, I'll call it a parade of schools. We're like, we're going to have a meeting, each one of our meetings at a different school so we can talk to that administration, we can hear what the concerns are, we can hear what's going on at the different buildings, and then kind of figure out where is our priority. So we actually started that very March at Eight Corners, and it became very clear at that time that Eight Corners, in addition to our K-2s, have a need. We then kind of went to the middle school and we heard about their needs and kind of thought, oh my, we've got two big pots here that need to be addressed. And then this enrollment kind of reality came in and started over fleshing mm -hmm. out the projections. And it was like, okay, because my next meeting was going to be, I had actually, this is in the notes, let's get together with the Wentworth Building Committee. I'd love to hear what the process was. How was that committee fleshed out? Who was on it? What was the process? How long did it take? Um, from the first meeting to the first student walking in that door and really getting all that together. <clears throat> this reality that came about at Eight Corners jumped in front of that meeting. So that meeting actually is now going to be on April 10th. Mm -hmm. um, and so that conversation about actually having a building committee for Went uh, not Wentworth, excuse me, based on the Wentworth process and then tweaking it to go in to look at the primary schools and figure out which way we want to go, my gut tells me it's going to be a little more of an involved conversation. I wasn't involved in the Wentworth mm -hmm. conversation, but I do know that this community is much more divided on exactly what that long-term solution is going to look like than perhaps they were in the Wentworth situation. Um, and I think that uh, that owes its due when we have to give that conversation what it needs. Um, but that process has to start, and it has to really get traction. But while that's happening, as Julie said a moment ago, the students are coming. Mm -hmm. And these portable classrooms are not an optimum solution. They're not a permanent solution. I'm not going to stand here and think that we should have portable classrooms all over Scarborough and everything could be mobile. I, I don't like that notion, and I know that I've had some people yeah. in the community bring that to my attention. And um, a more permanent structure is definitely what we need. Mm -hmm. um, but in the short term, three to five year window, which in my opinion is the shortest you would ever see anything permanent show up here, um, we definitely need to have some space for students to go. Can, can you just let them... What are we going to be looking at 
next year, if it's five years, mm -hmm. and your growth projections. I mean, yeah. are, are we looking at multiple modular units between now and then? Well, right now we have what? 20? 22. 22. Well, no, but I mean, yeah. sure. additional to what we have yeah. now. And actually, if you, um, I don't have it with me, but if you look at the, the 2017 plan, there's actually a diagram in there showing how many modules we have now and how many we're going to wind up with if we do nothing. Uh, in five years, just to kind of, well, I can give you three years because I have it sitting in front of me. In three years at eight corners, right now there's 227. It's forecast to be 281. Pleasant Hill, 188 to 233. And Blue Point, 195 to 241. Pleasant Hill and Blue Point right now have a couple spaces that could be freed up with relative ease, so they have some expansion ability. Eight Corners really doesn't, and that's one of the reasons why we haven't advocated for redistricting, because redistricting really will just push the problem from this building to another building, and then all of a sudden they're going to have a problem. So it's, I, I, I so, just, yeah, so, go ahead. Yeah, so do you think that the school board would be coming to the council and then to the full, uh, to the full community? within 36 months asking for um, some solution based on your recommendation, whether it's a single K-2 or pre-K-2 or um, a new school. I mean, wh what is the timeline? That's what I'm kind of... Sure. Is I don't, it's I don't have an months? exact timeline for you, but I can say that it is, is the top priority for a long-range planning commitment. But, but Once this immediate crisis is... I, I'm still trying to struggle, though. And, sure. And it builds on what Councilor Bateman, but if we're looking at adding several module units every year for the next three to five years. Have we done the analysis? Are we better off pushing that construction, that project up? Because when we build the primary school, mm -hmm. these trailers are going to become valueless. I mean, we're, if we're investing half a mil every year, sure. have we looked at why don't we accelerate that mm -hmm. process? I mean, that's my question. If we're going to be looking at two or three units right. every year. Mm -hmm. That's going right. to be a real a real yeah. issue for us. So I, it would be helpful to, was that discussed? Yeah, yeah. Sure, yeah. I think Julie would have the institutional knowledge on this one. This is, sure. I don't know so, what's been discussed. Yeah. Uh, there isn't going to be, um, the, the growth doesn't call for, you know, four or five modulars every year at every school. That's not what we're seeing. I think that if we were to put four modular classrooms at eight corners this year, we wouldn't be having this conversation next year. But I do believe well, that if we only four, put you two, four trailers, classrooms, four classrooms, two trailers, two trailers. <clears throat> um, so if that's what the need actually shows in the next three years. But we also recognize that we want to be thoughtful. We want to be fiscally responsible. Mm -hmm. We want to invest in what we know is coming. Um, and then see if the enrollment projections play out as accurately as they have in the past before we make that full investment. So there will be two years where you'll be having this conversation um, because we, we know that the, the projections are calling for that. In terms of the timeline, so when I came, when I came to Scarborough in 2016, July of 2016, there was a very robust long-range facilities plan. And in fact, in that plan, it considered the option of possibly closing one of our primary schools. And from my very initial analysis, just looking at the enrollment data, I couldn't see how that could be feasible, given what the projections were showing and given what I knew about the growth in the community. Um, and so we re-engaged Harriman, who are the architects that we used to update that plan. That took a good, I came in July, we made a presentation in November, so a good 14 months, and that was at a pretty steady pace. Um, we'd have to go right back to that same place again because I think the options we were considering were based on, well, I know they were based on different enrollment numbers, but we also know that public preschool is going to become a reality in the next two to three years, um, and we have no space for that, zero. Um, so we have to think about that, and that is something that we did talk about in the last um, long-range plan that was updated. So I think that if you were to move, even if we had a plan today, which we don't, and we had a decision today, I mean, just look at the public safety building as an example. That was, if we already had voter approval, we aren't going to have a new school within three to five years. Um, the process that it will take is going to be, it would be, we would be fortunate to open a new school if everything went smoothly and perfectly in five years. I don't mm -hmm. see that even being realistic. The other thing that we have to be cognizant of are what are the other 
community needs and priorities. Um, and I heard loud and clear um, in my first initial years here that it was public safety, public library, and then community center really were the three things that seemed to be the emerging priorities. Um, that was shocking to me and surprising to me because I'm, again, thinking about when kids come, they need a place to go. But we, we have also tried to be thoughtful around that and understanding, you know, how do you give to get, um, which is also why we haven't pushed a project forward more aggressively. And when you start to talk about a consolidated pre-K three, which in my mind would be the best option for Scarborough because then we could take our sixth grade students out of the modular classrooms and put them into Wentworth and we could build it would be a very large early childhood center or very large elementary school, but you could there's ways to make a big school feel small and you could have like an early childhood center and then a one, two, three building, um, share some common facilities. I think there's even ways to incorporate the ask for the community center that we hear regularly. Um, but that's that even if that was the idea that everyone in Scarborough said, brilliant. You know, who is this superintendent? We should keep her. Um, that isn't going to happen in 18 months, right? That in and of itself, just planning that would take a very long time. So uh, that's the emergent need that we have, right? Um, we, we understand the political pressures. We understand the emotional, um, the emotional aspects of it. But then here we have a need, a very direct need. So I understand uh, uh, the issue of dealing with reality and dealing with uh, events that happen while we're planning. Um, but, but somehow um, suggesting that, you know, that we're going to be you know, potentially investing money in eight corners, which, as I understand it, is a, is a really tough location for a neighborhood school. I don't know if anybody <coughs> walks to school there or not, but that's a, you know, that is a busy traffic area. It is largely a, a commercial area. Uh, so here we are recommending we're going to invest in probably one of the worst locations of any of our uh, neighborhood primary schools. And we you know, don't really have a view for how to solve for the bigger problem or a process. I mean, you talked about the timing and process high level. And all we have to go on is six slides. You know, McKinsey, you know, is famous for telling their consultants, you know, you should never have a PowerPoint presentation longer than 10 slides. But it does seem to me that of those four additional slides that we could have had here, there should be should have been some reference to some choices and options and how you how you arrived at this recommendation other than uh, immediate need, impact fees, let's get to it quickly, and then we'll go on down the road with the rest of the budget. It just, I, I don't, it just does not feel good, e even understanding, you know, completely how we got here. It just, go ahead. No, no, I, you, you yeah. started with a holistic yeah, so, question, so, so I'll, yeah, so I, I, I got some I'm, too, I'm so. back to the data, because yeah. I, um, before I get into kind of the more global pieces, um, what does this, um, so of course, whenever you look at this, and I understand that there are 17 special needs and um, those students have different requirements that are very unique, so I understand that. But when you talk about um, the numbers that you have that are outside, um, how does this impact, if you were not to get this, how would it impact the classroom size, either at eight corners or district wide, or as far as the configuration? Uh, where are you today on, on a, a teacher ratio? And what does this do to, based on your projections, what does it do on a teacher ratio basis? So right now at eight corners, we're at, we have four first, four kindergartens, four first, four seconds yeah. of each. And um, class sizes are at 1920, which is the max of what we would want at those age levels. Is that the state level or is that our? Our, our level, which is much higher than the state average. Okay. Um, what is it, just for the record, because people watching, what is the state? I would have to check specifically for okay. those grade levels, but I think that most schools are like between 16 and 18 16 for 18. the early okay. primary grades. Okay. Um, but I can find a specific source. If we don't add any additional classrooms yep. to eight corners, class sizes will go up to 21 to 25, depending on the grade. And that would, I think it's important to know that we're, we're going to experience growth in each of our neighborhoods. The greatest growth mm -hmm. is at eight corners. 
And to your point, Don, I agree with you. It's not the safest location. I've said from day one, I get the nostalgia around our neighborhood schools, but they're not really neighborhood schools. We don't have a walkable community. Folks, even, you know, I live over in the Blue Point community, which might be one of the more walkable communities, mm. but that's only if you live right there off mm. of, um, you know, like Old Blue Point Road or Pine Ledge. And so um, I think that that's something that's part of the conversation that Nick is talking about. And I think he's right to be thinking how to craft that and structure that in a really thoughtful way. Um, so, so I guess. So the, just to finish, yep. the, so, so the why behind Eight Corners, Don, is because it's the only school that has space in its footprint, if you will, for us to add the classrooms. And it's also where the growth is. Think about what's happening here. Eight Corners um, is off of Muzzy, is on Muzzy Road. And so we have the gateway, we have the downs, um, we have the carriage, carrier, carrier woods, um, the oaks, like all of these high density areas feed to that primary school. So partly it's because it has the only, it's the only school that has space um, or has the best space, we should say. It's not the only. Um, and it's where the growth is. So I just, I, I just so, want to, would, you, would you mind if I just, uh, that way I can just finish with all my questions. Sorry, I didn't know you were done. No, 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 no. no. Sorry. So I just wanted to suggest is that with all the, or around the data pieces and then the process is that um, I look at this from an, um, there is an immediate need issue, which is separate from a long range planning. And I really hope and encourage that the school board might try to escalate that long range plan and that we have a so permanent solution um, sooner than maybe the five years or whatever might go out because um, there's an obvious um, need and there is also an obvious um, curiosity by the community about what that's going to be so that we can prioritize it properly. So um, with that, I'll just... Yeah, and, and actually, sorry, I've got some yeah, data go questions ahead. too before yep, we... Yep, so, and then sorry, I've got yep, that's right, you were, you were, yep. Can I just get clear on if you go, it doesn't have slide numbers, but this slide that you have here. Sure. And we're talking about one, then we're talking about two. The way this is written, you know, you're saying should be ready for late fall 2019. That's the first unit with two classrooms. Right. Late fall meaning November-ish, December-ish? Yes. Okay. But and then... I'm and still then, hopeful that if we had... Stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still hopeful because I just have to be an internal, op uh, internal optimist that if we're able to move this project in April, that the likelihood of it being ready for the start of the school year with lots of hard work from Todd um, it could happen. But we don't want to overpromise and underdeliver, so we're trying to be conservative. The reality of it is we're not the only schools in this situation, and so Todd could speak a little bit about the research that you've done over the last couple of days. Yes, well, and what so we've many recently months. learned. Um, but the, so the ordering process for these uh, units, uh, first of all, they're built in Georgia. They're no longer built in Oxford, Maine, which we all think when we think ski hobby, there they are. It's, they're not built in Oxford. They're built in Georgia. Yeah. And the, the manufacture time would be just like anything else. You get in line, everybody else is manufacturing, and right now the, our representative up there in Oxford has told us that if we could, best case scenario is we put in an order in April, um, the units might show up in August, and then we would have the fall to fit them up and assemble them and prepare them for use. Can we stick build them quicker, though? Probably not. <laughs> I don't know. Depends on so, so I'm just going back. So, so I understand that. And I think what you're asking for the third is that we take it out of the budget cycle and decide to use the impact fees for that. And then I want to get clear. Then the second one, you say, could be ready for 9-1. If it's going to be ready for 9-1, that means it has to be in the budget. So are you putting in the budget? this second, this P2, so we're looking at <clears throat> voting to take on impact fees on April 3rd, the first unit, and then we will see in the, the capital budget the second one? Yes. Yes, so right now if you look at when you see the budget, you'll see that we have four classrooms or two trailers in the CIP budget. That's not, we don't anticipate that going beyond first reading. E either way, that will have to be revised to be but we anticipate that there will be two <coughs> classrooms or one trailer in the FY20 CIP budget. 
And what that allows us to do is avoid being in this exact same situation next April yeah. when we see that the enrollment numbers have proven to play out accurately. And then we're back, you know, trying to ask for um, funding so, to, do, to move that. So I, I just want to get clear. We're actually talking about two units between the impact fees and the capital budget. Yes. Yes. Okay. And that, from from a process point of view, that does create, can create some issues for us. Because one, we haven't had the conversation about, you know, in some cases we might be better off bonding things mm -hmm. than using impact fees. Because those impact fees, you know, we have been using them for debt service. But as we talk about the primary school, they could be important. And one, one calculation might be interest rates now are pretty low. Five years out from now, interest rates may be a whole lot different. So I think we need to have a conversation. Are we better bonding versus using impact fees? And if we bond and it's over 400000 then the charter says that's a whole different process, right. which is something for us to think about. Um, and then, two, what I'm struggling with, so when you said, and again, this, this, is, this is a little different agenda, but you're talking about 21 kids, 21 to 25 kids is what we're talking about as being the immediate need. I mean, on, um, you, you say growth is that, plus right. 21 through 27. In the initial projection, yes, but what's actually coming true is, is outshining that. So it's likely to be higher than that, am I? Yeah. So, so actually, that 78 was the other day. Today we have 80... I believe I was told 85 students enrolled at Eight Corners, and so we already. Yeah. Seven more. But right. so so right. are there, is there additional space? I, I thought there was another classroom in another one of the primary schools. I thought Whitmer oh. still had some additional room. Have we looked at thinking about remixing where we're sending yeah. kids or redistricting? Yeah. Well, you're gonna have to redistrict anyway because it sounds like. If the modulars are only going to go at eight corners, then you're having to move some kids, unless all those kids are coming from that school district. That is, they are coming those from Those are the numbers community. for eight corners. That's so just that, eight corners. So Blue right. Point's also projected, I think it's 12 students, yeah. and Pleasant Hill is projected to receive eight additional students. So at Pleasant Hill, if you remember last year, we added a teacher at Pleasant Hill to accommodate the growth. So we now have four kindergartens at Pleasant Hill. We typically have three. So those four kindergartens will go up to be for first grade. We anticipate that we will add another teacher and have four um, kindergartens again at Pleasant Hill. We have a classroom that could be repurposed at Pleasant Hill that's currently used as storage, I believe. It's more so, of a, it's like a meeting room right now. But it, so, there, so there's space there to accommodate the growth that we <clears> see coming in Pleasant Hill. And then at Blue Point, we have two classrooms that could be, that one is being used as a safe space or a break room um, for students when they're escalated and need to be in a safe room. It's been completely desanitized is the, the word that Todd's department uses. So that would be turned back into a classroom or sanitized. Yep. Um, and then the other room is being used as storage, which would have to become a classroom. And so we added a teacher at Blue Point this year also because of the growth that we saw coming um, and we anticipate needing one additional teacher there to accommodate the students that are coming. So, so it sounds like it wouldn't be ideal, but there is some additional space. No, it should sound like there's not additional space. So I did <laughs> not do a good job describing that then. <laughs> um, what, what we have at Blue Point right now, we have four first grades, we have four, kin or we have four second grades, four first grades, and three kindergartens. We're anticipating next year needing four, four, and four, which means that we would use at least one of those classrooms to open another kindergarten class. What you can't predict is, you know, are all of these kids actually going to be kindergartners? Will we see some growth in the other grades? Because we're also at, um, at Blue Point, or actually at Pleasant Hill in second grade there. They're at 21-22 this year because they only have the three sections. Right now, at Blue Point, our kindergartners are at 18, 20, um, I think we have one class of 21 there. So there would potentially be one classroom, I would say, in the 19, 20 school year at Blue Point that could be available. Um, but what's tricky about redistricting, it's not like all the kindergartners move into the same neighborhood, so we can just say, like, okay, everybody on this street, you're going to go to Blue Point school. Um, it's more complex because they're scattered throughout our 55-square-mile town. And you also have the sibling issue. 
So if I live in the Eight Corners neighborhood and I have a sibling in first or second grade and I'm an incoming kindergartner, you can be sure that my mom and dad want me to go to kindergarten at the same school as my sibling. And I didn't want to go to the same school as my sibling. <laughs> <laughs> and so there, but that is absolutely something, you know, again, to Don's point, that we analyze um, and actually in our planning meeting ask the principals to say what would be the impact of some of these things. So we've also asked the principal at Eight Corners, Ann Lovejoy, what would be the impact? Say you don't get two additional classrooms, but we take art and we put it on a cart, and we take music and we put it on a cart. What would that do in terms of programming? <clears throat> um, and so we've assessed that. We've also looked at Wentworth School and said, okay, Wentworth, what if we had to take all of the second grade students and I, I don't even like to say this publicly because this will create hysteria among teachers to be thinking about this, but we do, we did lots of what if, you know, kind of conversations, and then we assess the impact of that. And so I think the, the big question we have to ask is, do we want to compromise the programming at many schools, or do we want to address the issue at one school um, and better serve our students while we also develop a, a long range, more sustainable plan? The last question, and just kind of because this feeds into something else. So, you, so are you saying that there's more growth in eight corners than we anticipate? Where is that growth coming from that surprised you? Because we've been under the assumption that the new housing that's going in puts a very low demand on school. Mm -hmm. Are we finding that some of the units we're building actually are having more of an impact on the schools housing. than we existing. thought? What's that? It's existing housing. It's well, it, she referenced all new it's, projects. So. It's existing housing, but it is also, when we did our last enrollment study, the Gateway was not a part of that. Um, the Downs was not a part of that. Carrier Woods was not a part of that. And there's several other projects that I'm not thinking of off the top of my head. Um, those, those weren't in existence when we were doing our previous study. So what Rebecca did, and I think that um, her methodology is pretty tight, and I would encourage you to, to watch that presentation that she did in January because it was really informative. Um, but she looked at all of the existing um, buildings, uh, building projects in town and you know, how has it played out in real life. So we have these projections for you know, 1 point or 0.33 kids per bedroom or whatever that ratio is. She then went back and analyzed, analyzed that. And so much like we predicted, no impact with one bedroom um, units. So we're not look, that, doesn't, that doesn't affect the schools. But there's you know, some impact with two and three bedroom units. And so she looked at that, what's really playing out in real life, and also at birth rates. Um, so can you, Tom, can that, can that data be shared? So as we're looking at projects down the road, we have a much better way of yeah. trying to measure. The whole study is public. And it's been shared. Um, we can certainly, I thought we shared the, it with the council. The January 17th school board meeting has her, at least her PowerPoint presentation um, linked to the board website. Yeah. I just think it would be important for maybe Kara Martin to take a look yes. at that as we. It, as I recall, design. they were not appreciably different than the, uh, the impact expectations that we had worked into our ROI model. Um, more of them are coming online, so we'll get more data, actual data that we should look to. I think it's really the birth rates that is the, the strongest predictor. And again, why we're saying we want to see how these projections flesh out is because when we look at birth rates, we know that children are being born to mothers who live in Scarborough. It goes by the mother's home address, but we don't necessarily know exactly what neighborhood they live in. Um, so that's where then you're looking at the type of development that's happening or the type of housing and comparing those two and making your um, best estimate. I think there's also been a shift to a lot more children in developments like the Oaks. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that. I mean, I know driving by, mm -hmm. I noticed right off how many kids were standing out front. And I actually asked Julie point blank, and I think you told me at the time, 48. And that was just K to 5 in that one development alone. And that's, that's shifted. And that's mm -hmm. you're attracting more and more renters that have children and that's kind of a symptom of our economy I think but I also I think that more and more people are choosing to live in multi-unit um, uh, developments with families than more so than you see in the past. Right. I understand it. I don't like mowing my lawn anymore than anyone else. <laughs> any more questions? None of the data, no. Um, so I guess um, 
I have, um, so moving from the school, as far as um, I wanted to ask some questions, or if you, Tom, if you can give an overview of the fund account and the history. I know that you provided me early, but if you can share the data that you collected for me so that everyone can see it. Um, so what Tom's handing out is really since the inception of the uh, school development impact fee in 2001, Tom has provided a table that shows both the total fees collected annually, the interest earnings on an annual basis, and then what was used, um, budgeted to pay for debt related to schools, and then what the current balance is. Um, Tom, do you yeah. want to add to that? Sure. So this uh, impact fee ordinance is, was first put in place in 2002. Yes, January 2002. So uh, I, I guess I'd encourage you to look at the shaded column in the middle. That actually shows the actual fees collected in the in the given years. And the method that we've used historically, in fact, every year, is that we have included in the budget to offset school impact, uh, school debt, I should say, the actual receipts from two years prior. So we were never dealing with estimates, we we're dealing with actuals. If you take the average of the annual collections, it's something in the order of $260,000 a year. If you look down at 2017-18, uh, we had a bumper crop that year. We brought in 709000 A lot of that had to do with this rush on multifamily, um, particularly at the end of the year, to, to snap up growth permits, and they had to pay all their fees at the time. So that's really an anomaly. But if we used our normal methodology, this year looks pretty darn good because I would have, you know, four hundred thousand dollars more in revenue to offset debt. Um, I've learned the hard way that it's it's not e it's very easy to take that easy way out. But next year we're going to go back to the reality, and so uh, I guess the point to relate to you is that there are excess funds beyond what we normally use and have become accustomed to in this account. And that balance is just over 1.1 million at this point. I expect we'll certainly be continuing on historical levels. I don't think that's going to wane whatsoever. It might be a little higher than average, actually. So I have uh, your review of the of the impact fees, and you said it's roughly 260 thousand a year. Yeah, average it out over so time. Went off there for 2018. <clears throat> so it's a question for the school folks. So. If, if this gets approved, then how, how does that affect your budget proposal? Say it were not to be approved, what would your budget proposal look like? If it were not to be approved, we would be budgeting for the 260000 that you see here in our CIP budget for FY20. Along, yeah. along with the other, so the B4 in the budget? No, we no the other one's we, in the following we would We would have to do that in FY21. Yeah. And, and your thinking for that would be would be that would also be uh, an expense item, or would you look for that to be capitalized? The other four, I mean, it's 160000 I guess, right? So, Right. So I think that um, one of the questions we had, which I don't know if, if Nick, you might have gotten clarity from the manager, was what, is there any predictability to what we might be collecting in terms of school impact fees? Because I think ideally, if we could fund this whole project all together over two years through school impact fees, um, or at least be able to compare that to what would be the value of funding it outright through school impact fees versus bonding it, given that the interest rates are predicted to go down, um, that would be, to me, that would seem like a good fit and a, an ideal. Um, but I think the, the challenge that we have here is timing. So we want to be smart about how we fund it. It's going to have to happen one way or the other. Um, so it's a matter of what's the most efficient and effective way for us to do it. And that's why we wanted to come to town finance, town council finance first. The only thing I would add to that is that the, the bumper crop that you were, you were talking mm -hmm. about a few moments ago, when we talked about, I was just gonna say out loud, the downs and how that might be kind of some surge bumps to this impact fee, we're probably not gonna see that for another four years. When I spoke mm -hmm. out and, and talked to the SETCO about it, mm -hmm. they said you're gonna have some some bumps, probably year four, year eight, in terms of that process, and that's when those units come online, get sold, and that's when the impact fee is collected, as I understand it. Do we collect the same impact fees from residential that's built in the Downs project that we do in other parts? Oh, sure. Yeah. Not all residential are created equal. They're, they're, so the highest is a single family, because that's shown to be the have the most impact on the schools. But there's lesser uh, amounts for two-family 
multiplex mobile homes and affordable units. But, but it's uniform. But it's, yeah. it is uniform. It is uniform. Absolutely. Can I, can I just, I, I'm confused now again, going back to, I thought what we, the question that was asked, if, if we do not, imp if, if we don't decide to use the impact fees on April 3rd or whatever, you, you were going to have, in order to have this other trailer, P2, in place by 9120, you need to have both trailers in the capital improvement budget in the budget cycle we're in now. Is that correct or not correct? They're in the budget you, now, right? Well, yeah, so they are the question. In the budget now. Um, right, so that was the question Don was asking. That, that if we, I think he was asking, if we decide not to do this off cycle of the budget, your response is going to be you're going to put this. The trailer, the unit we're talking about, will go into the budget we consider the normal budget process. Right. Is that correct? Except that we would we would have to push the part two, phase two of this, into FY twenty one. I don't understand that. Why? What? Because the for, the trailer, two trailers, cost one hundred and sixty thousand. So if if you four <coughs> two trailers, four classrooms, cost three hundred and forty two thousand. Plus, you have the cost of the pad, plus the cost of yep. the furnishings. Now, for yep. two, um, two trailers, right. it's it would be well over the four hundred thousand dollars threshold, and that would trigger a whole different process. Well, that right, <laughs> right. Then that's that will be a question that we need to think about mm -hmm. with our community Absolutely. about that. Yep. So, will, but when, it, when I asked the question that. Other than that aspect, that's what you would do, is you'd put it into the capital improvement budget. I would put two classrooms and the pad for four and the finishings and utilities and all of that in FY20, yes. And that would mean that there's no way that other trailer, those third and fourth, would P2 not, would not be available for yeah. 9120. Correct. The right. only way for them to be available for 9120, you're going to have to put Get the, the four year. classrooms right. in the capital budget. And we would, so. we would, we would not want to put, um, even if, so say you say yes on April 3rd and we're able to move this project forward and Todd can get started preparing for this coming school year um, on April 4th, we would still put the two classrooms I, in the FY20 capital improvement budget, but we would only, we would only consider purchasing them if the enrollment numbers fleshed out. So we would still want that year to, we yeah. would still want to give ourselves that year to see are the, pro, are the projections, because they're fresh, we don't have any, yeah. his, I mean, we have historical data from the previous study, but with this new study, other than what we're looking at each month this year to see are they on pace, we would, we would want to be more fiscally conservative and wait a year to purchase the other two. So Tom, can I ask a favor? Mm -hmm. So I know um, having dealt with the issue of these portables in the past, um, when I first started, um, when um, middle school was built, it was built too small, and we started right off the bat with portables. Um, can you get legal opinion regarding the issue? Because I know for a fact that um, it has been opined in the past by our council that the, two ish that the two purchases do not need to be aggregated together for the purposes of our charter. Well, do recall the charter requirement, which requires voter approval, yeah only happens in the event, it concerns itself with how it's financed. It only right. happens in the event Correct. that it's uh, issuance of general obligation bonds. Bonds, yeah. So if we want to bond it. Right, right. I, I will and I'm not suggesting bonding right. it's the right way. I'm just saying is that it will address the issue that's really at the heart of what they're asking. It's, a, it's the, about the bonding piece. It's pure and simple. I, I will, if, if it it's takes the bond. route of going through the normal budget process through this, the yeah. capital improvement budget, uh, I'll be recommending some uh, the use of some level of impact fees, not for purposes of evading that requirement. Yeah. I just don't think it's good budgeting practice to bring in a kind of one-time revenue this year and only fall off the cliff next year. I'd rather mm -hmm. smooth out the peaks and valleys. Uh, and I, it's my prerogative. I propose the budget. That's the way <laughs> I'll posture it. Um, and I think there's very sound reasoning for that. Tom, when you say smoothing out the peaks and valleys, you mean between expense and capital, or what is your? Well, if we, if we sweep in this six seven hundred nine thousand to offset debt, that looks really good this year. It's yep. nice. Next year, that goes away. Yeah. And so we're going to have four hundred thousand dollar hole to deal with. And okay. I've just learned the hard way that I'd rather smooth those things out. And, if, and it appears as though there's a very legitimate use, right on point, uh, to use these funds. So I. I I would highly consider or recommend that you consider use of those funds okay. to fund the purchase. 
I think the difference is a month, which doesn't seem like a long time, but we live in Maine, and you know, getting that building in place, a month really matters. Yeah, Weeks matter. Amazing. And I'm getting ahead of my, just one last question, Dad. I, I think last year when we, in the past, the capital improvement budgets, look down the road to see what's coming. Yeah. And I thought you guys had really projected huge or pretty significant expenditures in the current primary schools. There's boilers, there's all sorts of work that needs to get done. I can't remember where Eight Corners was. Is Eight Corners one of them that's in rough shape? It's the middle school. Middle school really. The middle school HVAC is 23 years old. I, I thought, uh, I thought a, Pleasant Hill is but no, it's no insulation, it's just cinder blocks and it's all sorts of, you guys had like that, That's true. All <laughs> that is true. Pick your problem, we have them. But, but um, no, but the middle school is showing itself to be more problematic because there's 123 heat pumps in that building and they only fail when you need them. They fail in January and whoever engineered the building, I don't think, I, that's probably the way they did it in 1996. There's 11 heat pumps by comparison at Wentworth. And so we've asked this year for significant funds to replace heat pumps at the middle school because they're all failing. And you don't want to replace them when they fail. You want to replace them before they fail because then people aren't put out of their classroom because it's eight degrees outside and their heat pump doesn't work. So the needs at K2 has not materialized into CIP requests yet. I think those are kind of all caught up in this long-range discussion. Yeah, we try to keep the boilers going at the K2 schools for 30 years, and they're reaching 30-year-old yeah, time frame. But, but uh, yeah. we've still got four years to go. Your, your point's well taken. We are <laughs> staring at some major reinvestments. Well, I think that was part of the reason Absolutely. why we concluded There's building no the schools that are they throwing money at yeah. the old the, the one There's exception. no question that we have more to do than we have money to do it with. Uh, I'm wrong here, but I believe in the current budget you do have funds to expand the parking lot at Eight Corners. That's a separate yes. project yeah. that yeah. is separate. On, yeah, ongoing as we speak. related and capacity right. issue. <clears throat> Correct. So um, with, with regard to the um, conversation around the fund itself, um, so Tom, I did want to say thanks to you and Ruth for presenting that. I think that's great information because, um, you know, we all kind of wondered. I remember being on the council when this got enacted, and we all wondered how successful it was really going to be, and it shows uh, that success in the numbers. Yeah, it's worth noting. I it didn't truly see it. is. It's $5.2 million we've collected since inception. And we, yeah. so. And we spent 4.2, which gives us the one point. I do want to reference as part of the uh, school board's presentation, they do give us a reference to the chapter uh, impact fee ordinance, chapter 415. And I'll just read the first sentence um, just because there is this question about that this is somehow unique or that it's not appropriate. Um, it states very clearly under f section four use of impact fees. Impact fees collected by the town pursuant to this ordinance may be used only for financing facility improvements, which the town council has determined are made necessary by new development. And then the last, second to the last is impact fees collected pursuant to this ordinance shall be used exclusively for capital improvements and shall not be used for operational expenses. So I think, I hope that kind of answers the question about the applicability and, and I think the right use of uh, what those fees were originally collected for. Um, as far as whether or not it's a better time to bond versus this is, a, I think, a different question. We all have kind of uh, that eight ball that we shake about where interest rates are going to be. Any any other questions regarding the, the fund itself and how that's been managed or uh, uh, anything? We like? I, I, I have a question yeah. I think was for t would be for Tom. Mm -hmm. So where, what would be other typical uses for impact fees? Okay, so we're talking about... You know, this this looks like a legitimate use, but how else would they be used? What other, what are the trade-offs we're making? Well, impact fees are governed by state statute first and foremost. I believe what Councilor Davine just re read you was kind of lifted uh, from statute. Uh, so they, the, but the basic guiding principle is that impact fees need to be used for their, the the purpose for which they were collected. That's true of traffic impact fees. We even go so far as to draw a geographic area, we have um, either estimated or actual project costs that we need, we're looking to recover or offset. Um, and so we've got to be very particular as to how we spend those funds. They're not available for operational, they're not available to the general fund. But they could be used to replace these boilers that are, you know, aging out in these other schools. That Arguably, kind of yes. But they need to be devoted to school uses and the traffic fees are used for other things, road improvements. That very specific within a defined okay. geographic area. They can't be used town-wide. We have probably 
uh, eight different areas that all have a different fee associated mm -hmm. because of the uniqueness of the need there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's worth noting this is the first time we've ever kind of gone out of cycle. We've always used it only yeah. to offset school debt. And unfortunately, we've always had sufficient debt um, <laughs> to put it against. <laughs> Um, with that, any other general questions for staff or the school? Not on, not, not on the, the facts, if you will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just in general comments? So, so um, just kind of to get in your mind. So generally speaking, um, the, um, the, the way I view this is that the Finance Committee, as an item, should take up the, act, uh, the request and make a recommendation to the town council as a whole. Um, keep in mind that recommendation could either be positive or not to approve. So either one is it technically acceptable. Um, and that's because we are a minority group of the board and the board as a whole is a majority. So therefore they can uh, take up that request. Um, so kind of with that, my goal is that there, I'm hoping is that there is some type of motion um, around this. Um, that we can then vote on, it will become part of the record, and then we'll make that report to the council as a whole, as part of the finance committee and as an action item that gets placed on the agenda. So are you looking to us for a motion? Um, I can present, I want to hear comments, I mean, because okay. I think that you guys have comments before okay. we get to that point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Doug. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with uh, putting this forward uh, to the council in the fashion as described. So I believe this should go through the, you know, the normal budgeting process and, um, you know, perhaps that would give us additional time to fill in some of the blanks around. I mean, we're comparing basically a short-term need versus long-term issues. And I haven't heard a, you know, very convincing discussion of the other short-term options. And I have, haven't heard of, you know, very convincing discussion about how we're going to solve, even how we're going to solve for the longer-term issues. And the thing that, that is, uh, Puzzling to me is that I uh, let me just switch for a moment. And most of the growth someone mentioned is coming from Carrier Woods and also from the Beacon and Gateway, which are pretty new, mm -hmm. pretty new developments. And they're you know they're not in the Downs District, but they're just sort of in the neighborhood. I'm just wondering you know if we really are 36 months out from solving from some of the long-term questions. You know there's got to be you know, a, a better discussion, I think, between, you know, solving an immediate issue and then, you know, how we're going to solve for the larger question. I, I just don't feel confident that that I know enough and have really walked through, you know, with the folks that are closest to it enough to know really what the true options are in the trade-offs. And, and I think that if we're, if we're struggling with being well-informed, I can only imagine there must be many, many more questions among the public in terms of how, how this has been framed and how it needs to be resolved. So that, that's my reasoning for that position. So. so could you make a few suggestions or give us some feedback on what additional information we might include to frame it more conclusively? Yeah, I, I would just like to see more upon uh, more from you in terms of the meat in the sandwich. You know, I kind of got the we got the data and then we got sort of the long term issues and an immediate solution. I'd like to know what the other options were short and long term and where that's going to lead us as a process. I just there's a middle part here that I'm missing completely in terms of data reasoning choices that have been made even to get to the point of suggesting that we, you know, begin by investing in uh, uh, in trailers, you know, at a school that is one of our toughest locations. And I think by doing that, it could imply that we're going to, you know, that we're across the bridge uh, over the, the question of, uh, of neighborhood schools, which I, I, I don't know if we have or not. So. Don, could you ask a specific question just in tr just to give us some direction? I know Julie just said, and you said, and you say the meat in the sandwich. I, I'm, I'm asking as generally speaking as possible, because when you say you haven't heard a convincing argument for redistricting, for example, would be an alternative. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the data, I haven't seen the options, and I haven't seen the breakdown, you know, on terms of what is leading you to a solution on that. You know, that's just one redistricting. If you isolate the other, the other choice of, uh, for example, um, neighborhood schools or not. How, how did, you know, what were the issues? choice neighborhood schools are not. Right now we have neighborhood schools. But the future and our 
commitment to neighborhood schools as a longer term strategy i'm just not seeing a connection i think it's a different conversation just because right now we're here to talk about the immediate need fair fair enough but what i'm saying is if we solve for the immediate question then we're solving for another immediate question and how many years have we been you know at the process of trying to define what the next phase is for us in terms of school capacity and buildings and solutions so i just and the best i heard was from nick 36 months well i, I think the answer to that is over two decades because we've just been adding modular classrooms to our existing structures and we're now we're at capacity we don't have space to keep adding modulars um, except for here at eight corners and eventually you could do that at pleasant hill if the need arised but that wouldn't be our long-term suggestion i don't believe right no i agree with that and I, and I and i do it's been brought up three times now so i'd be remiss if i didn't say it out loud I'll apologize for the brevity of this presentation because my goal was to make it as concise and clear as possible, knowing how many ancillary presentations surround it, like small moons. And one of them is the, the 2017 facility study that has a lot of this meat in it. So it might just be a matter of us pulling in more of that and maybe fleshing this out a little more so that we can see how portable classrooms have been used in the past. And I'll be the first to admit, and I said it last night at the open forum, it concerns me how permanently they've become used in some of our applications mm -hmm. in the middle school is a fabulous example of that. I think this, and April's right, this conversation was intended to be much more of a let's get through the next couple of years investing, quite frankly, as conservatively as possible at Eight Corners for all the reasons that have been said tonight. Um, but Julie said it best, these kids are coming and we have to have somewhere to put them. And so as you think about this request, I'd, I'd hesitate... I want you to hesitate thinking about it as a way to skip talking about permanent solutions and instead think of it as a way to get us to a point where a permanent solution could ever be enacted. I don't want us to even skip the process that's in front of us that will start on April 3rd, and right. I think that's what you're proposing, and I'm not, not willing to vote in favor of that. Peter? Yeah, I, I, can you clarify that? What process do you think we're skipping? Uh, that you would include this in the context of your budget discussions and that it would go through the same process of review and discussion that we will be using to, to hold forth on issues of similar size and complexity that other departments are going to have to go through. And somehow, with this recommendation, we're short-circuiting that process for the school because we have an immediate need and we need trailers in September. So I, I, I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to the to the other folks that are involved in the budget and you know and I'm not sure it's even fair to the folks that have kids in school to follow that process because I don't think those issues are going to be adequately aired in this abbreviated process and decision that you're recommending you know it's a it's an ask I would call this an ask this is an ask for uh, $420,000 in two bites you know it's coming in one bite of 260 and then another one of, of uh, uh, you know, 160,000. So, and we're and we are studiously avoiding having the conversation around capital. You've already recommended, hey, the money's there. It's an appropriate use. I don't have any issue with that. What I have an issue with is building support for the idea in the community and even among the leadership. Um, and I, I feel that there needs at least to be the process that we have for the budget to go through that. I mean, if we're at the same place at the end of that, I'd say fine. But if you're asking for a vote on April 3rd. I think that's that would not do justice to the process or the issues that we're considering. Peter? Yeah, I guess where I am, and I understand the facts, and I understand the information. Um, my concern is just more with, and, and it's an overused word, um, optics and perceptions. I mean, we all we're all new, you know, all new council, all new board of education, and what we community, what we committed to is transparency and involvement and getting people engaged. And my only concern is, I mean, April third is next week, and a lot of people I've talked to know nothing about this. I mean, you may have been living it for a long time, but I think what you're hearing from Don. This is the first time the three of us have gotten sort of exposed to it. We've got four other council members, but more importantly, what we have tried to do every time this year, we're trying to and any of these issues that we know are going to be highly controversial with the community. I've already gotten, for those that do know about it, 
I've already gotten emails saying, please don't do the trailers. I mean, they're calling them trailers. And, <laughs> and I've gotten, I don't know, five or six of those. What, what I would love to be able to do is to have a workshop so we can actually get people to get educated about it, come and inform us about what they're thinking about it. For us to just, the three of us, to recommend it and have it. And then I think the optics that get really difficult is on the very same night that we're going to see the budget for the first time, the first time we're going to see the budget. So we have no idea. So when you reference other capital expenditures, I don't know what's in there from Tom's side as of yet. I don't know what's in there for other capital expenditures. It's just, it's just a tough optic to kind of put that on the table and vote on it the same night we're seeing the budget for the first time. So for me, it's, it's the process. I'd love, and I would love to better understand what is our absolute drop dead date so that a decision could be made so you could get that trailer delivered for September. A month um, ago. Well, I, I know, I know, <laughs> but maybe there's, Maybe there's a sweetener or something. There's always ways. Um, I am more concerned about the community engagement on this um, and, and finding a forum by which we can at least get them to be able to speak. However we do that, I can, I'll look at all my peers how to do that. I'm uncomfortable leaving this meeting and saying to recommend that this be on the April 3rd town council. There may be other mechanisms by which we can do it. I, I just... I'm uncomfortable with doing that. And, and again, part of our part of our goal is we have committed to our fellow town council members that they will have adequate time to be informed so they can make decisions. So having them just get it, just as you saw with us of all our questions, I suspect the other town council members will have similar questions. So we need to find a little different process and we can work together as a team to figure out what that is. Um, that's my immediate concern is April 3rd, I think, is just not the right timing for our community. So one thing I'd just like to kind of as a wrap up, kind of a this is the last thing I really want to say about this, not about this trailer issue, but about our timing and all of that. One thing that's been very clear and I want to do due justice to everybody on my committee is that since this conversation started right up until yesterday, we've been reasserting the importance that there are, I know there are optics behind the timing of this. And we started our conversation tonight actually talking about that. And the committee, and myself in particular, are committed to the fact that the reason we're pursuing the impact fees has nothing to do with avoiding a referendum. I want to make that as clear and concrete as possible. But, but understand, we can all have the best intents. Sure. And best intentions. Yeah. It's, but we have to look at it through the filter. What will community members think? Right. And, and yeah. you're, we have a better chance of getting them under yeah, the tent. Absolutely. I just want, yeah. I just want so, to take the moment out loud to say that for the people yeah, that work no, with I, me, I, that I, worked I, very hard yeah, on this, absolutely. that this was not meant to be an under the carpet initiative. No. I and I just want to make that very clear on public. And, no, on record. Yeah. And, and I would say that part of the timing of this was us learning about how do we access know. the school impact fees because we've never done that yeah. before. And frankly, um, I'll admit my own ignorance. I didn't even know they existed until my neighbor was building a new house. And he's like, what do you do with those impact fees? Yeah. And I'm like, I don't know what we do with those yeah. impact fees. Let me find out. And so that was my quest you know, over yeah. the last few months was to learn about that. Um, and so I think that, um, again, this comes down to trust. I think this is the biggest challenge that we have in our community. With the community. Um, yeah. I, I could not have less stake in the game than to yeah, do what's best for kids. I, I mean, honestly, no, no, like there's no win here for me personally. No, no, I, I have no motive other than to ensure that when 31 kindergartners come to Eight Corner School yeah. to have their very first experience in public <clears throat> education, that it's safe and appropriate. And right now, we don't have adequate facilities to do that. I mean, 70% of people in town, I don't know, Larissa, what was the number you said most people get their information from the, the leader? Is that... <laughs> and so I mean, even so, I mean, that would be a great first step: is get something in the leader so people so. are aware. Actually, so, Sean, can so. I ask a question? Absolutely. Um, Tom, it's probably a question for you, and it, mm -hmm. it sort of piggybacks on on right in the way. Julie's learning curve about the impact fees, and 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 I don't fully understand it yet, and I'm not on the long term um, committee, but I'm on the finance committee, and and so it seems interesting to me that the town is. Cl collecting these fees for the purpose of school capital improvement projects. 
And to me, part of that seems like a town decision, but part of that seems like a school board decision. And so can you describe sort of how that decision making coexists in between the town and, and the school and at, at what, you know, how, how, how those decisions arrive collectively, I guess. Yeah, I really inherited, stepped into a, a longstanding practice. Uh, Ruth Porter is the one, certainly was here at, at its inception. Um, it was never done consciously to keep it away. Um, the fact is we've always had sufficient annual debt service cost, um, and, and, and this was clearly a legitimate use of these funds. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say there weren't, couldn't be other legitimate uses of those funds, but it was kind of clean and consistent, and that's the way we've done it. Let me ask it to you differently then. It just seems curious <clears throat> to me that, I mean, clearly the town has the authority to release and approve the, approve the release of that money to the school. But to me, it seems curious that the town also has the authority to decide how those decisions will be made to spend that money. To me, that seems more of a school decision. And so, with 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 all deference to the way it overlaps, I mean, and I understand that in terms of you know potential financial impact to the town. But to me, that sort of seems like what should be a delegation to the school. And and so. Why is that not the school's decision to say, this is a need that we have, these fees are, are collected for this purpose, for, for capital improvement purposes, and this is what we need to meet the growth of our schools. How does that then become the town council's decision? Can you explain that to me? Because I don't understand. No, I can't. I mean, you make a good point. I, I, I think that's a point that should be uh, discussed among the two boards as to how those, those Well, I think that speaks to the nature of how the long-range planning committee approached the finance committee. I think that that... Well, I can't... Uh, so just to add, and, um, just having been a uh, reader of the charter so many times, and I'm not <laughs> by any means the expert or the part or whatever, it does state specifically that the town council is the appropriate of all town funds. So we appropriate all funds regardless. But you appropriate it, but do you... Do you decide what the use is for? So that's where get, that's where the role, and so part of my comments was going to actually talk about the role of the council versus the school board, because it's very clear that um, we are only the appropriator of the funds. We do not decide how you then spend that. And so as an example, and I use as my own experience, um, I remember years ago when we were only a half-day uh, kindergarten program, the school department at the time asked for it to go to full day. And the council and in the individual comments said, no, we don't, don't want that. So they cut the budget for like 500000 School department reappropriated and reprioritized and still funded all day kindergarten because we have no say. The town council has no say in any program at, programmatic, any use of the funds um, by, any, by any means. And that's my general understanding. I'm not, like I said, not an expert, but believe me, it's been ingrained in me over 20 years. I mean, so. the, other, I mean the other piece of it, too, which I mean, it should be something for discussion, is that the, the capital improvement funds are approved for the, for the school budget is part of the town council of approval too, and that may or may not be appropriate, but that is the process, the rubric that we kind of live under right now. Um, yeah. That may or may not be the right thing to do. It certainly is something right. for discussion. Well, let's say that this money was released for, for debt services, as it sounds like you've done in the past. How does that process occur? What What's the type of vote and presentation that it's occurs? It's part of the annual budget process. It's considered a revenue, debt revenue, if you will, to offset multiples more in debt service cost. So, I mean, what's different now than any other time that this is approved by the council? It, well, you're, you're on a budget cycle. Mm -hmm. So it has to go before the board as a whole. Okay. Um, it is a capital expenditure, so it doesn't have to go to the voters, okay. uh, which is different. Mm -hmm. And we've got an amount that's doubled than we've ever seen before in one year. Yeah. So I think those are kind of the unique factors. Right. And Julie just became aware of it. Yeah. That's the third. <laughs> so are you also, I just want to make a couple of comments. Are you also? Yeah. yeah. So I want to address a couple of things. Um, first, um, big surprise, I am going to disagree with both of my distinguished uh, counselors. Um, I support this um, wholeheartedly. The fact is that in any business model, you react to the immediate mm -hmm. needs based upon the timing in which you receive that information. You received much of that information recently. I believe it was in late December or January when you got projections regarding enrollment. Um, so this is about a short-term solution to a long-term problem where I don't disagree 
with my co-counselors is that we need a more immediate solution that's faster than 36 months regarding our schools and um, what that needs to be done. Um, as far as the timing with other projects, I'll take that into consideration when the, when the request comes forward, um, if I'm still here. Um, but the fact is, is that um, I did want to mention is that I think that the request is consistent with the legislative intent of having been on the council when this was approved uh, regarding the impact fee reserves. Um, I don't think that the expense is unreasonable given the considerations. And I do want us to be very careful in the amount of information. I think there's a, there is a nice to know versus a need to know as a town councilor. Um, the why, when, how, and what of this decision I think is a school board decision. They've been charged by our community to make that decision, to perform that analysis, um, and that as counselors, um, we should trust that. And the fact is that this community has come a very long way in a year. A year ago, um, the community said that they didn't trust the school board. I thought that they were wrong. We have a new school board, and we should trust the decision and the analysis that they performed, and we should um, 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 acquiesce to that request because this is not unreasonable. I, I do want to also mention that I think that um, you know, as, as we go through this about the process, um, so w whether, um, how do I explain this? Per pursuant to our own council rules, any counselor can ask for an agenda item to be presented to the council. So even if, uh, if the request is of this committee not to present this at the council, I am going to request it as an individual counselor that it be on the April 3rd agenda. If they decide at that time that they want to workshop that or table it and take, a, take an extended process, um, I will respect that as far as uh, contributing at that time, but I think that it does need to move forward so that we can have that and it should be an agenda item so that they're aware of that. Um, I, I think you've done an excellent job in kind of bringing us to understand the challenges that we have. Um, I, I think the comments that I've heard, they're all well intended. I mean, it is absolutely horrible. The traffic pattern around eight corners, the layout of eight corners, absolutely. But the issue is that we have an excessive amount of kids, not excessive, we have some wonderful kids coming into the district <laughs> that need an immediate solution and this has to happen. Um, and I hope that we take that into consideration as we look at a longer term. So um, I, I will support that. Um, the question I have now to you two gentlemen is how do you want to phrase a motion? I can, I can phrase one that is in the positive. If you would like, you can phrase one that's in, um, that would uh, reject this. Uh, I want to be kind of acquiesce to how would you like me to do that? Would you like me to just make the motion? I'm not, I don't want to make a motion and then have it, it die from no second um, since it's going to be a positive one or if you would like to rephrase and you know, give a motion in your own words then you know, I'll do whatever you want. So the only thought I had, uh, uh, and I know you're asking for a motion, not a question, but uh, the only thought I had is if we were able to you know, agree that it would follow the same process that we are using for the budgeting process for, you know, a decision, uh, you know, as, uh, as soon as it could be considered and reviewed uh, from April 3rd. So, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting dry mouth. Um, I think that's a question and a debate for the council as a whole to take. I, I think it's a valued question. Um, I just, um, I think that we've done our job in reviewing the request um, we should move it forward to the full council and have the majority of the council decide what that next step should be, which could be, um, and by the way, April 3rd is just the presentation by the superintendent. We could ask that it be included as part of the budget as the outcome in that conversation. Um, you know, it just needs to be brought up as part. I guess my motion would be, um, I motion that we have a workshop on this um, as soon as possible. Um, so that we can have this conversation with the full council in a workshop and then at their will go from there. <clears throat> so when you say we have a workshop, the three of us? Well, I mean, it, no, no, we're up, up full as, you know, usually this would be a full workshop of all the town council members and the representation of the Board of Education that, that wanted to be there or not. Could we... Um would you be interested in having that workshop on April 3rd before the town council meeting? That is up to the gentleman next week. My problem, you know, I, I think the purpose of having a workshop would be to be able to get the public to be able to come to listen to the same thing we listen to and then to be able to offer comments. Our preference and what we've tried to do this year is not vote on something the same night we have a workshop. So we could have the workshop on the 3rd um, and then we could look then, you know, we are meeting 
wins the next time we meet. We've already tenth. committed to the library in the third, unless you, you want to do go two earlier. workshops. Yeah. <clears throat> but anyway, the motion would be, Sean. I, I mean, I know you can put it on the agenda, but I would, I would motion that we work as quickly as we can to get a workshop, get the public informed, do a workshop, and then bring that back after after the workshop. So we can at least get public comment and react to public comment. I think that is important to our community. I think that's important in what we all committed to at the beginning of the year. Sorry, I'm thinking I'm trying to write something down to make it formal. So what you're right, could you say like in the next 30 days or something like well, that? Well, no, I mean, I, think it, I, mean I, I would say as soon as possible, as soon as we can get yeah. us together. As soon as practicable. But. I mean, it, the next time we're together is the third. We've already got a workshop at six for the library. So we, so we you know, depending on the flexibility of the other council members. I'm looking at Julie, but I'm quite certain this, this need will be included in their CIP request in, in the budget that we present. Is that true? Uh, that's what she said earlier. Yeah. 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 So the other thing is just let the budget process run its course. But I think that puts them outside of the, I think the, right. the pressure Understood. point is that puts you outside of the window of. We're outside right now. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to sound so negative, but we, we're outside the window now. Uh, further discussion is required, then that's the way the process has to work, and we will do the best we can with the, the decisions that are made. So the motion, um, and I'm going to word it, if and we can correct it, yeah. is that the Finance Committee makes no recommendation on the school board's recommendation for a modular unit at Eight Corners School, and that we request that the Town Council hold a full Council workshop at a future date. Um, I'm okay with the I mean, I, I think that, so I guess I'd rephrase that. I think the, the finance committee's recommendation is that we do a workshop. It's Just a there. point of clarification. We presented this Thursday right. night in a public meeting and had public comment, and we presented it tonight um, out of a courtesy to finance where there's public comment, and we will present it again on April 3rd where there's public comment in a public meeting, and there's public notice for all of those things. Um, and I know that collectively we would be happy to prepare as much information as you all would think would be helpful to get to the full board by Friday, the full council by Friday, as we, as our practice with our board when they have to make a decision. Um, my worry is that knowing how schedules work and saying as soon as feasibly possible, that could be well outside of even what the budget process mm -hmm. is. And we wouldn't be presenting this out of cycle if there wasn't an eminent need. And so I would just, I guess I'm just wondering if after three meetings, public meetings in public with public notice and public comment, what would be different at a workshop plus a round table where folks were able to come and hear directly from the board? I mean, one would be, I'm not sure if we're outside the cycle, but what's the leader cycle? It would have to be in by today, right, for their articles? I believe you're right. For Friday. I mean, that's the key is that, you know, I've, Usually when we have the budget meetings or we have issues like this, we put out a notice, it's, we usually get more attendance. Um, and some of this is just the work, so the counselors aren't seeing this for the first time. I mean, I don't know, I don't think, I don't think all the council members have been to those public sessions you're talking about. So that's the intent. And part of this, again, is um, we have been criticized in the past year about Things happen quickly. The public's not informed. We don't. So some of this is is to to do that. I mean, so that's so that's the motion. I don't know. Can I make a comment really quick? So just to be a pragmatist for a moment, and I, and this is just a statement of fact. It's not meant to be postured in any way. But basically, we're on the very edge of what's possible for even having this thing operational in the 1920 school year, right? right? Well, no, you said late fall. I mean, you're already. But let, let me finish. So if, if this doesn't go forward, and this is not a pressure tactic, but if this doesn't go forward for April 3rd, then really trying to schedule out a workshop after that date that we could talk about it and then come back at a future date for another, another vote that would probably be behind the regular budget process anyway, I think the, the point of a rush, if it's not going to go forward in the third, then there's no point to rush at all. Am I right in that? Well, let's talk about rushing, though, so you... you 
given us a request to have the town council decide on the third. So that has not, to be fair, given us, you know, even the members of the finance committee sure. a chance to get educated. And, you know, we're, so we talk mm -hmm. all the time, right? We, and I know you've had meetings, but this wasn't, we didn't see it on the agenda for this meeting until I think it was Thursday of last week. And I'm checking my emails to be sure it wasn't posted even as an agenda item for us, even through our own communications. So uh, I, you know, I understand how we got here and why we're here and you're doing the best you can with the timeline, but, but uh, because, you know, we're late to the party with your request, we can't make up, you know, what can we do to make up for that time? I mean, it's an unfortunate thing. And I'm not Absolutely. placing blame or pointing fingers. We're committed to try to solve for it. But uh, I just feel, I think you've heard the reasons for why we feel uncomfortable about, uh, about uh, how it was uh, presented to us. The, the practical effect of the motion is that it will go through the normal budget process right. and be subjected to the review and, and approval through that, unless you choose to do something before final vote. I suppose is a possibility. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the conversation, that if we have the workshop and the, the rest of the town council members think it should be something that's out of cycle because of the very reasons you've articulated, mm -hmm. um, there's nothing to say that that couldn't be done, right? No. No, we would uh, modify the budget request and you'd get your money you know, a month earlier than you would otherwise, I guess, or get your authorization. It sounds like Councilor Baybine is going to insist that this matter be before the board for council regardless. So um, I think it's important for this motion to be worded to reflect the, the majority position of this committee. Um, but it sounds as though the issue will have its day before the full council. Yeah, we, we got notice of it on Friday, Friday afternoon, the published agenda. Yeah, as, as one committee, I, I'm not comfortable that going to the full council based on things that we've committed to without having a workshop to get the public I understand. Yeah. I'm just saying, so Councilor has so the prerogative to get the So idea the question I have to is. staff, and to the, how, would you like to withdraw the request and just simply bring it up as part of the budget? Given the feedback, feedback I'm hearing, I mean, I, I, I will, um, um, I, would say I, I don't no even, I, I'm afraid of saying the wrong things, but. I'll say no. I wouldn't okay. withdraw the request because I think it's my professional and ethical obligation to bring this forward to the town council. And I think that it's just another opportunity to have the conversation in public and for our community to hear about our needs. Great. But I would. No, I think that's fair. Want to hear what I mean, my, my gut reaction was like, well, maybe that's the most pragmatic approach. But to your point, I think to be committed to the students and do everything we can to get them the facilities they need, we need to, we need to pursue this. Right. And while so. I fully respect the opinion of the committee and the majority of the finance committee, this is a board decision. So I would like to bring it before the board. Okay. So um, for our purposes, um, gentlemen, I can neither accept a motion um, to your, if you can word it for me, um, or we can just simply um, uh, leave it as it is and then it will be um, presented. I, I am making a formal request that it will be on the April 3rd agenda for the town council. Um, and we, as a chair, I'll just simply respect that there is no report out of the committee. And then, well, we, can, the, and then we can all... Well, I think the report out of the committee is the majority view is that it should not go to the town council until there's a workshop. I think that's... Yep. That's that's the view of the committee. So can you please make a motion? The, the motion is that this should not this issue should not come back before the town council should not come to the town council before there's a workshop. Is there a second? Second. Any comments or questions? I think we beat that dead horse? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, all in favor. Um, of your motion. motion. Yes. That's two, all opposed, it's one. Thank you. And given that this is the only item, the only remaining items are um, future dates. Just to mention that Wednesday, April 3rd, uh, will be at 7 p.m. is the town and school budget presentation by the manager and superintendent before the town council. It starts at 7 p.m. on Monday, April 8th, is the first uh, town finance committee budget review um, along with the school department. Um, and that is from 5 to 6.30. Um, I don't have a place where that's located. Do you know where it's located, Tom? 
On the 8th? Yeah, is that the library? Is that the one I'm doing at the library? I think this is the neighborhood budget. I thought the 8th was your school board meeting. Oh, that's, that's just the school, school board. board okay. Yeah. It says town finance committee. Oh, that's the school board review. Sorry. Yeah. Too many meetings between town and Augusta. Sorry Thank about that. You. I hope. Yeah, yeah that's, that's our change. meeting. That is our meeting with them. And then um, I'm not going to go through all of the nine items that are on the agenda. They are similar to last year. Uh, sorry, the last meeting. Um, and I'll take edits offline if you need to add anything, gentlemen. Um, the next item is public comments. Anybody would like to speak? Not seeing any. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. Do I speak for public yeah. comment? Um, I would just like to extend an invitation to the full town council and the community to our budget workshops that are happening. We will do a very deep dive into um, what's in the budget and what's not in the budget this year, beginning on Tuesday at 8 30, 30 to 11 30, 30 to 30, right here in Chambers B. They will also be televised, I believe. Um, and recorded and then part two of that will happen on Wednesday from 3 to 5 30 again inviting the full council and the community to um, Engage with the school board and the leadership council in that way to learn a lot of very specific details about each of the school's budgets um, on Wednesday night before the town manager and I present publicly and then the school board's first reading will be on Thursday night where again there will be another presentation um, highlighting various aspects of the budget. So lots of opportunities to learn a lot, a lot of detail about the school budget. Thank you. Um, Tom, I did want to mention, actually, I just realized, I knew that date uh, was conflicting in my head for a reason. April 8th is also the chamber dinner? Yeah, I've reached out to them and asked them to modify if they could. So, all right. I don't they can. I know school board members and council members. Right. And state yeah, I don't think are invited many attendees. And staff as well, so. Yeah. So we may have to look at that. So we'll keep in touch. Um, no, uh, public comments already gone. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? A unanimous vote. Thank you.